For over 10 years, we at Climate One have been engaging policymakers, influencers, entrepreneurs, and activists and scientists in broad, respectful, candid conversations about everything climate. Food, energy, water, technology, transportation, housing. We've had huge success bringing together people who think they're on opposite sides of issues. When they sit down and have a candid conversation, they often find common ground and the basis for real solutions. We're emotional beings. Thoughtful, inclusive conversations create the conditions in which the changes we want to see become possible. So I want to hear from you. When you talk about climate, how do you talk about it? More importantly, what do you want to be talking about? With whom? Join the conversation. Even make your own video. Invite your friends to join you. Let's talk climate. Thanks for joining us for this live stream discussion of flooding in America. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area and would like to acknowledge the Ohlone and Miwok people who inhabited these lands for 10,000 years. This program is generously underwritten by the Water Foundation. I'd like to thank our friends there for making this show possible. For many people, too much or too little water is the way they will first personally and directly experience climate disruption. We'd love to hear from you today, so please share your questions in the comments section of the live stream, or you can tweet them at us using our handle at Climate One. We're reaching a growing audience via these live streams, and we're thrilled to include people around the world. To those of you who've made a donation today, I want to thank you for supporting the awesome Climate One team that brings these programs to you. We're grateful. The United States is experiencing a rising number of extreme weather events that cause billions of dollars of debt, cause a billion dollars or more of damage. Destruction is increasing, even adjusting for inflation, according to NOAA. Flooding is the biggest driver of economic losses. Since 1980, a trillion dollar in damages have been caused by floods. 2019 was an especially bad year, driven by record shattering rainfall and major floods in the Midwest. New data suggests many Americans are facing more flood risk than they realize from rising rivers and rising oceans. I'm delighted to welcome three fabulous guests today to help us drill into the data, the risks, solutions, and human stories. Julia Kamari Drapkin is CEO of and founder of IC Change, a social impact company. Ed Kearns is Chief Data Officer at First Street Foundation, which publishes data publicly available on flood risk. And Martha Shulsky is a climatologist for the state of Nebraska. Welcome to you all. You. Julia, uh, let's begin with you. You had an unexpected and traumatic experience with water growing up on a barrier island in Florida's Gulf Coast. Tell us what happened. Yeah, I think when how we define trauma kind of shapes us. Um, but maybe, yeah, it was it was very much a, a, a moment where I woke up in the middle of the night and we came downstairs and the Gulf of Mexico was in our living room unannounced, an unannounced guest. And I was 12. And the idea that we could have such a, a catastrophic flood event without any warning was 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 shocking. Um, I think my mom used to break out into hives for a good while after when she would hear about storm events or hurricanes and whatnot because it was so disruptive. Uh, and we were uh, brought out by the National Guard on one of those kind of you know big vehicles. Um, I created IC Change though after many events. Um, Memorably, like I spent 15 years as a climate science reporter and saw the disconnect between people's everyday daily experiences and what the climate models were telling folks and the disconnect, both in terms of how people were experiencing events and their inability to relate it to the bigger picture data, as well as the bigger picture data often being wrong about their experiences in real time. And so feeling the need to kind of create a, a mechanism for people's everyday experiences to inform models and vice versa, we created IC Change, uh, which gathers and mobilizes uh, community stories and micro data about climate impacts in real time. So I do wonder what would have been like if I had IC Change when I was 12 to talk about those events, uh, the no name storm of 1993, which I think a lot of people on the West Coast of Florida will always remember. Ed Kearns, you grew up in um, in Miami. Tell me about you know your early relationship uh, with water and how that relates to my your, the, the relationship now with water in Miami. Yeah, yeah, I, I did grow up in Miami, Florida, and uh, you know grew up uh, fishing in Biscayne Bay and in Florida Bay, and 
I loved physics in the ocean and ended up uh, you know, pursuing a career in physical oceanography, uh, which has been you know, tremendously rewarding. Um, and uh, I, you know, after um, you know, do, doing all sorts of different kinds of research, it got the chance to come back uh, to Florida uh, to uh, be a professor at University of Miami. And then after that, um, worked at the National uh, Park Service in the Everglades, uh, working on the uh, Everglades restoration project there. And, uh, you know, just in the time between growing up there and coming back and, and, and working there, you know, to me, it was obvious to see what the, the sea level had changed uh, there in, in Florida. But, um, you know, it is, it is a gradual change. Uh, but if you're used to being in the environment and fishing the shorelines in particular, it, you, you just can't miss it. Uh, but then as part of the, uh, the comprehensive Everglades restoration program, of course, with a focus on water and water budgets and where water, where water is, where it isn't, and the timing of, of all that water. Um, you know, the, these are also things that uh, we need to bring into the planning process. And that was one of the things that really, um, you know, in, in that project and in working with government to try to figure out how to incorporate climate change into that restoration effort was one of the things that really brought uh, climate change and water together for me. Martha Shulsky, the floods of 2019 were historic and unprecedented. Tell us about the scale and impact for people who didn't experience them or may have forgotten that they happened. 2019 was really an epic year in flooding, particularly in the Midwest. Yeah, it sure was, Greg. It was a record-setting year, and and timing was everything with this particular event. And I'm from Nebraska originally, and have lived here at different times in my life. And we all know that we do have wild weather in the Midwest, and things like this do happen. But the scale of 2019 was just was just epic. And uh, it, what led to it, the antecedent conditions, the conditions in place when the storm did come along, that had a lot to do with the scale of the impact. We had gen- a cold overall and wet winter. We had uh, one of the snowiest winters on record in Lincoln and Omaha, frozen soils, um, saturated soils. 2019 was actually the wettest year on, on, one of the wettest years on record for the upper Midwest. Um, And snowpack sitting on the ground, uh, lots of ice in the rivers. So the conditions were ripe such that when we did get that strong storm system move across the country, which is not so uncommon to have a storm of that proportion, but the setup was there. And to have that rapid snow melt Um, we're just not able to handle the water at one time that it did come. And so that led to the very large scale and for a long time period, uh, there are some locations that the, the river levels did not go down for, for over a year uh, length of time. And so, so the, the spatial and temporal scale of this was, was quite large. The New York Times did a a special interactive feature where you can kind of scroll down the Mississippi, Missouri rivers and just see the normal, uh, you know, footprint of the rivers and what they swelled to. It just it just gives you a dramatic sense of of the scale and and spread of all that water. Martha, one other thing that that happened then was um, flooding from the Missouri River shut down the runway and inundated 30 buildings at Offutt Air Force Base south of Omaha, which is home to the U.S. Strategic Command, which oversees America's strategic nuclear forces. So that just, you know, evokes images of some scary movie with a nuclear command flooding. You know, what are some of the, you know, strategic assets? We'll talk later about um, farms, et cetera. But, you know, the idea of the U.S. Strategic Air Command being flooded just makes me really uneasy. Right. We have SAC. We have Offutt Air Force Base that's right along the Missouri River. Um, We have nuclear uh, power stations that are located along the Missouri River. Uh, We have transportation systems. I-29, the interstate was shut down. So we have a lot of assets that go right along the river, Um, not to mention agricultural lands, uh, the the acres that did not get planted in Nebraska and elsewhere because of this flood, all the cattle that were lost, uh, towns that were cut off. Um, So, yes, very significant uh, impacts to this flood. Uh, I want to go to um, that that period was uh, January to May of 2019 was the wettest on record in the United States causing, you know, floods as we've described. One of the farmers whose livelihood was threatened is Jack Mulliken, who lives in northeast Nebraska, just outside the town of Nickerson. He farms corn, soybeans, and this year as he tries to recover even a little bit of hemp. We asked him to talk about what happened and what he thinks could be done to protect farms like his in the future. About half our land is in the rolling uplands, so the flooding usually doesn't involve that, but uh, the rest of it's down the Elkhorn River 
valley bottom and the Platte River bottom. We had a lot of snowfall in February. And then uh, about the middle of March, 13th of March to be exact, we had a 70 degree day. Everything started to melt. We have this hillside that's full of terraces. And of course they were full of snow. So the water just went right over the terraces. And I went out and started cleaning them out with a loader to try to stop it, but uh, it was too late. I, we had 600 acres we couldn't plant because it was just totally devastated. It's taken till this spring to get things finished. It's been pretty difficult. I don't think you need any big flood control measures taken. You know, the chance of a, an event like that happening again, I think it's pretty rare. I don't believe it's man-made climate change. It's just the way things are. You just have to adapt to it. And that's the way we live out here. We just deal with whatever comes at us. The big thing is, like on the Missouri River, we have all those dams up and down that river. And the Army Corps of Engineers needs to rewrite their playbook on that a little bit because we get into the problem with environmentalists wanting to keep a certain amount of water in these dams so to protect these fish and these birds and snails and whatever else they're worried about. And then when something like this happens, it's out of the Corps' hands. They can't release the water over the winter when they need to to prepare for this snow melt in the spring. They put those dams in to help with flood control. Well, now it's turned into recreation and environmental issues. I don't know how to fix that because there's, it's such a powerful political movement. I don't know who can uh, get in the way of it and turn it around. That was Jack Mulliken, a farmer who lives outside Nickerson, Nebraska. Julia Kamari Drapkin, um, easy to snicker or kind of, you know, someone like that. Um, how would you, if you ran into, had a chance to meet Jack Mulliken, what would you say to him? Oh, I would sit down with coffee with Jack, with Jeff and talk. Um, one of the things that I think when it comes to understanding flood risk or climate risk, what it requires is time. Iterative dialogue over time and deep listening, deep listening amongst all stakeholders, farmers, fishermen, the people that we associate potentially in, in kind of the way that we've parodied the climate conversation. It's, we say, oh, well, they are climate deniers. They don't believe in science. A farmer or a fisherman knows more science than any climate modeler, modeler sitting in front of their computer who hasn't been outside in a long time can. Um, the idea that, that farmers and, and ranchers don't understand what's happening in the environment is completely and totally flawed. It's the lensing in which they're seeing and understanding those changes um, and the way it's been politicized. So if there was an opportunity to sit down with him as well as some of the members of the Army Corps who are doing flood control, we could have a really great conversation and understand the different um, the math and the calculations going into a lot of these decisions. And that's why we created IC Change, which is its own social media platform for communities to gather their stories and their data so that they can have their own evidence of how change is happening year to year so it's much more legible. And we actually developed that from ranchers in Colorado who don't believe in climate change. Because when you ask a rancher or farmer how they make year to year decisions, they will go and bring out a notebook with all the detailed notes about weather and climate on their farm or ranch. And when you sink that to a much more community pool of knowledge, wherein potentially someone from the Army Corps who's talking about a water level controls can actually converse, you know, talk about what their concerns are for that particular year, then you have a deeper empathy and understanding and a more nuanced understanding of year to year risk. So for example, in the Midwest, you know, we know that the 2019 flooding event actually was contributed to by conditions in the summer of 2018. Um, and I see changers have been documenting that. Um, and then when you go into those flood, you know, year to year risk that primes you for the next year's cycle. And so understanding that these years are starting to stack up and feed into each other, um, when you have a, a shared record to do that, then it's easier to talk about the likelihood of a flood event like this impacting you on a year to year level. We even have IC changers keeping detailed rain measurements storm to storm so that they can understand that a two year or five year, a 10 year or 50 year rain event can happen in the course of one summer. 
Um, and he, once you experience the data and understand it in the context of your own life, then you're much more likely to understand the differing stakeholders making very complicated decisions about infrastructure. Um, it's not just about the environmentalists. It's about access to water and la wa controlling water levels for safety. It's, it's dealing with aging infrastructure that hasn't been brought into the 21st century and isn't required to by federal law right now, frankly. Um, it gets complicated and there needs to be space and time to have that conversation. And I think um, Martha would agree with me, you can have a conversation over coffee, but then you take that conversation to IC Change and you can have it for years. I want to remind all of us to uh, be careful. So we might be picking up a little bit of keyboard or, or microphone sound. So I just want to sure. be careful of tapping on keyboards and um, might, it might be the microphone as well. Martha Shulsky, uh, you go around and, and talk to farmers and rotary uh, clubs uh, in, in Oklahoma. So you know, how, do you have the hard, how do you have these hard conversations with people that are in a very different place coming from perhaps experience, um, you know, sort of the, the lived experience that they have that maybe not be quite the same as an academic scientist? Yeah, I think how you frame it and how you talk about it uh, makes a big difference. And the content doesn't necessarily have to be different, but how it is presented uh, does make a difference. And active listening is part of that. So Julia mentioned that. And if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, then that's that's where I would start is, how do you feel about this? What changes have you seen? And when I hear comments like that, uh, often I, I'll get the person to talk and they'll generally describe the historical trends that we've seen, which is getting wetter over time, getting more more extreme precipitation events. And so they understand what's going on. Um, so I, I tend to do my research and do background and, and understand about the group that I'm talking to and frame the message such that they, they do care about it. You know, what does that group care about? Let's connect those dots to climate change because climate touches everything, it it's, touches all of us. And so making that connection is really important and having making sure that you have meaningful dialogue and not throwing, uh, you know, I don't go into this like I would my class or I would giving a professional presentation. That's not the right way that, in my opinion, that you need to approach it uh, is you need to listen to the person, figure out what they care about and connect those dots. And in some cases, maybe you don't even talk about climate change. Um, to this person, maybe you talk about risk management and profitability and decreasing soil erosion and uh, making sure their farm ground is up out of the river bottom so it's less likely to be vulnerable to these, to these large scale flooding events. And so there are, in certain settings, there are angles that you can take that is not controversial, like your health, like extreme weather events. And I, I try and remind people that weather events, that's how climate change is manifested. We don't, we don't feel the global average temperature, right? We can't sense that. We, I can't feel that, that average temperatures in Nebraska have warmed about a degree and a half. But what I can feel is the number of 90 degree days are going up or those dew point temperatures are going up or we got a lot of heavy rainfall recently. So uh, so those are the ways that you make it tangible and local and relevant. Ed Kearns, how many Americans are facing the risks of floods driven by human-caused climate change and don't realize it? Unfortunately, too many. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, from the First Street Foundation uh, viewpoint, so our, our foundation was created to communicate this, this climate change risk. Um, and... Uh, we picked flood uh, for the for the first uh, risk to consider because it's the most expensive, most pervasive across our country. And so one of our challenges was to uh, you know do a, a current risk assessment for today to see you know uh, the letter let everybody know what the risk is today and what it's going to be in the future. So uh, you know I kind of equate it to walking into the middle of a movie, right? And so climate change is the movie. So the first thing we have to try to um, convey to folks is what's going on, what's the plot, uh, how, how did we get here. Uh, and then we're going to tell them about where this movie's going, where, 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 the, where the plot's going to go and how the movie's going to end. And so, uh, you know, taking a, uh, taking a communication approach that's focused on the individual to try to make uh, all this complexity of climate change, climate models and, and uh, hydrodynamic models, hydraulic models and, and storm surge and all these different kinds of, of flooding uh, that, um, you know, are combined for a total flood risk to try to get that information down to a, a consumable 
uh, level for the individual is, is a challenge. And at First Street, what we try to do is, is boil that, all that information down, all that risk assessment down into one number between one and 10, one being minimal risk, 10 being extreme risk, and to, to let the individual property owners, so our, our, our the First Street uh, Foundation flood model uh, has, uh, has created a flood risk assessment for every single one of the 142 million properties in the contiguous US today. And we're, we're targeting through floodfactor.com, that individual that needs to understand at their property, at their home, what's their risk today and what's it gonna be um, in 30 years and boil that down, that cumulative risk and severity down to a single number. It is to wake them up to this reality and then uh, and then urge them and point them to, to resources where they can find out more about their local uh, community their, their local situation, their local flood risk, and, and really start to understand it and then take steps to mitigate that risk. So I uh, entered the address where I am right now. It's next to a creek north of San Francisco in Marin County. Uh, and it came out as, you know, 110, very low flood risk, which is kind of different than what I've, you know, as a guy who thinks about climate all the time and what I've actually observed and what I know is more intense rain events. So it, um, in, in your models, claim to be better than the FEMA models, which uh, notoriously kind of downplay or retrospective, they look backwards, they don't look forward. They, many people think that they downplay flood risk. What would you say um, to someone like me? It's like, well, I think you're downplaying my flood risk because that's, you know, that one doesn't seem accurate to me. Well, yeah, so, so First Street's uh, methodology is different from FEMA's. So, you know, I think it's a complementary approach, but like you said, FEMA's looking back, assessing the past, and they look mainly at river and flood. Uh, where First Street is taking uh, the heavy precipitation, what they call the pluvial component. So uh, like you said, we, we know from physics that for every degree centigrade increase in air temperature, you can fit 7% more water vapor in, right, into the atmosphere. And that water is going to come out in a heavy rainfall event, right? And so uh, we're, we're considering these, these combined comprehensive, um, you know, total impact on your flood uh, risk. Now, depending upon your topography, uh, that's very important. So, you know, just your local fire, how high your home is, uh, how, what the land is around it, but also what the adaptation features. So First Street is also considered those adaptation features, which are levees and, and pumps and seawalls that have been constructed around your neighborhood, perhaps to protect it. And uh, in, in our model, we are assuming that each one of those adaptation features is working to its design capacity. Uh, so if, if your neighborhood has been... Um, I'm not familiar with your address or your particular situation, but if your if your neighborhood has been protected uh, by one of these adaptation features for that kind of storm, then that would reduce your risk uh, perhaps more than you would expect. Julia Kamari Dropkin, what do you think about the First Street model? Do you think do you have questions or concerns about about its its uh, its accuracy or what's under the hood? Oh, always. I always want to look under the head of a model because when you sit with a modeler and you sit with IC change data from people like you, Greg, who are going, hey, you know what? That feels like it's underestimating my risk because where I live, uh, I think in Marin County, your soil is actually quite gravelly and kind of, you know, it just it could actually contribute to a flood risk in a high precipitation event. Or if you live in a community like mine that where we are protected by infrastructure, um, but we are assuming it's functioning at every level at 100% capacity. You add granularity. And um, what I mean by that is you add details that allow the model, you know, models are make assumptions about risk and they're averaging large amounts of time and space and intersections and and they can't always really account for your true risk. And so what we, our approach to modeling, whether it's flood modeling or heat modeling or climate modeling, is to take community knowledge about those particular places paired with observation over time about impact and then compare it to the model and integrate it with the model to um, validate it. We call it validation, model validation. In some places, FEMA has, um, like New Orleans or Miami, spent more time because of repeat uh, loss. And so there's a little bit more of mapping in certain places where Ocean City, New Jersey, where we have a very um, active community on ICchange.org documenting both rain and tidal flooding. They haven't had good mapping in a long, long time and First Street Foundation um, is provided added service. So I think what we are looking for in the age of models or AIs or here's flood risk on a phone is to interpret data as a conversation where community members have very much a role to play in annotating that data. 
in making it more correct. In, in fact, in creating incentive structures for communities to invest in adaptation and infrastructure improvements. Because you know, when we're using a, an AI or a model or an algorithm to tell us about flood risk and that's fixed and that becomes like fixed knowledge that is immutable, then there's no incentive for the city of Miami or Miami Beach to invest in the infrastructure and get the value that they're looking to achieve with it, let alone a homeowner. So um, we add that kind of add that that value add that context the annotation the the validation of a flood model. We also add impacts that you can't see from a flood model when it comes to there's pollution in my yard and my kids can't play from all this flooding, or I can't get to work, or I can't the bus stops running. Um, and then we also create room again for people like Jeff uh, in Nebraska to add his detailed knowledge, because one of the things about all these folks who are being impacted, particularly in the Midwest, down south, in, in, the, Missis in, in the Mississippi Delta, and in, in the Gulf of Mexico, is that there are so, there's so much knowledge about how an environment behaves, that if we create a system in which a flood modeler, FEMA, First Street Foundation, the Army Corps of Engineers can actually generate knowledge through dialogue with community members and they won't feel like as if they are prisoners to to math math that is often wrong if you're just joining us we're talking about flooding in america and climate one i'm greg dalton my guests are julia kamari dropkin ceo and founder of ic change ed kearns chief data officer with the first street foundation which is mapping flood risk around the country and Martha Shelsky, director of the Nebraska State Climate Office and state climatologist. Martha, what I'm hearing here is a bit of a sort of top-down, bottom-up discussion about, you know, climate models are, just, are built on supercomputers at elite institutions, very abstract. I've been doing uh, climate change conversations for 12 years. I don't think I've ever seen a model. I really, honestly, really understand <laughs> what the heck they are. Um, and we're hearing Julia describe this sort of much more, you know, grassroots crowdsourcing, uh, bottom-up approach to modeling, you know, is you know, I'd like to get your thoughts on on those two worlds of approaching something so massive and complex as flood risk and climate risk. Yeah, well, they're both important. You can't have one without the other. You have to have the science base and uh, that theoretical knowledge uh, and skill to understand climate and dynamics and physics and chemistry, and it's very complex. Um, but you know what's even more complex is people and how they, I mean, that's, that's the biggest uncertainty we have in our climate models is people and human behavior and, uh, and making sure that people understand it correctly. And so, um, so what I work in uh, at a state climate office, and I have colleagues uh, in every state in the country, and there's regional climate offices, and there's a national climate center. Um, we're at this intersection of, of this theoretical science, and then the, the, we apply it and make sure that people are understanding it, they're using it correctly, um, they're helping it to answer their questions and inform their decisions. And most of the people that I work with, they're not they're not scientists like myself, they're not climatologists, it's water managers, it's farmers, it's cities around Nebraska and the central US. It's those who use this information and making sure that they're using it correctly and interpreting it correctly. Um, so I think, uh, I think both to your original question, I think both of these pieces are very important and to apply this knowledge and to utilize it and inform societal decisions you have to have that trusted, reliable, science-based source of information. Uh, great, thanks, Martha. And our engineer is asking to, uh, I guess, if there's anything that, if we could hold your mic, that we're getting some noise on your microphone. I don't know if it's your hair or earrings or something, sorry about that. Sure. But um, sometimes just holding the microphone a little bit forward can help, um, help it touching on, I think. Thanks, Martha. Um, uh, Ed, there's a, a value bias in a lot of the approach to climate risk that uh, is towards protecting the most valuable real estate. Any city that's going to make an investment is obviously going to think about getting the best return on that investment, and that means protecting wealthy neighborhoods. So let's talk about the wealth and class bias and some of the approaches to protecting the most valuable property, which is where the rich people live. Yeah, so a lot of cities, uh, as they're trying to make these decisions about where to uh, where to armor their um, their uh, their cities, perhaps from the sea, where where to install levees or pumps to uh, you know these large adaptation features that we mentioned. These are enormously expensive infrastructure 
to, to put in place. And so, yeah, a lot of the financial models may include you know, n neighborhood uh, values in order to figure out where to where to move the you know move the um, infrastructure here or there. So one of the things that First Street is uh, very adamant about is, is democratizing the, the information so that we're removing the asymmetry and in information that's available to these communities in these neighborhoods, right? So most, most neighborhoods today um, yeah, may not be aware of what their flood risk is. Most of them aren't aware of the adaptations that surround them. Uh, it's one of the things that we take for granted that uh, you know, many of our cities are, are very well engineered, with great uh, civil servants that are, you know, uh, have worked hard to protect our, our neighborhoods. Uh, but with that comes a lack of awareness. And so by making um, the, the flood risk information available to everyone freely, uh, we're hoping to level that playing field. On top of that, uh, what uh, First Street Foundation has created is something we call the Flood Lab, which is a, a group of uh, researchers. We have about 100 researchers now uh, that are now actively using our data. And they're looking at societal and economic uh, questions such as that. Are, are there disadvantaged communities uh, that have more flood risk than, than we understand. What, what is that flood risk? Can we quantify that? Uh, can we start to, um, through the power of data, um, you know, communicate what uh, the actual risk is for these different situations and arm the decision makers with the right information they need to make the right decisions? Julia, you live at sea level near water in a swampy area of New Orleans. You know, how do you how do you feel about that? And, you know, New Orleans, we spent, what, tens of billions of dollars recently after Hurricane Katrina to armor the town. Um, is that holding up? We're still here, right? I bought my mortgage in uh, 2013. Um, I think um, communities like mine, um, Miami, Norfolk, Charleston, um, Ocean City, New Jersey, always shout out to them. Uh, communities in the Midwest, um, if you are experiencing persistent flooding or if you're experiencing risk, then we are learning fast and first. Uh, we are a first community, if you will, First Street Foundation, <laughs> in terms of understanding these events and details and adapting to them, um, innovating around that, understanding what mechanisms we need to, to, to use, um, the impacts of those um, of federal policy, the impacts of investment, um, understanding the impacts on every level of our community. And um, also understanding that, the, that our environment uh, is not just the, the natural environment. I live on a swampy area. I'm learning, I learned early in, in, in coming back to New Orleans, having started I See Change in rural Colorado, that um, living close to water in New Orleans is actually a great idea because we are subsiding and uh, by not having saturated, hydrated soils in a swampy environment, you actually are going to be in low ground. You need living closer to the water puts you, have, you have elevation, you have a natural elevation. So I'm at zero, but my neighbors across the street are in negative three, negative six, negative seven. Um, and that happens in the Midwest in, in terms of being on a river uh, and having that natural levee plane and how that natural levee plane uh, works. So there is this you know, and, to, and to, to be able to adapt to climate change, we need to understand the, the natural environment in which your city exists. And again, we try and encourage that um, conversation and dialogue and I see change about that. But it also means understanding the built environment and the social environment, because all of those combined create risk. And when we're only looking at the flood models or like an economic valuation of what is value in terms of what to protect, then we're making mistakes. So in New Orleans, we are protecting the city. But um, when, um, when we don't invest or prioritize infrastructure to protect communities of color, then we are actually um, not valuing their, the cultural and social fabric of the city, a city that um, before COVID had 13 million visitors to come and eat our food and enjoy our music and enjoy our culture. And by pushing those folks out, then we are, un we are pretty much doing economic damage to our city over time. Same with the, the folks who are fishing uh, in the Louisiana coast, who for the last three years, because of flooding and rain in the Midwest, we've had our flood infrastructure, the Bonnie Carey Spillway, open for the last three years. Historic. This thing has never been open in this. Like it was open twice or three times in the last century, but it's been open three times in the last three years. And that fresh water coming through the system with nitrogen and fertilizer from Midwestern farmers has devastated the oystermen and the shrimpers. 
And I promise you, they've been talking to the Army Corps of Engineers about this for decades. And that information could have been reacted to decades ago. We could have planned for this economically, socially, culturally. So I guess in the, in the, in the, in the math of where infrastructure is placed and what it protects and how it is valued, there needs to be a consideration for the things that are not easy math. Um, and and that, that really is how we truly understand, you know, there's a new, there's a new way of doing economics. Um, and, and I think that that, you know, should, it, you know, that's very lofty, but it plays out functionally in very real ways for communities every day. Dr. Shulsky, speaking of uh, infrastructure, there's a lot of dams in the Midwest that, uh, you know, a lot of people live within 20 miles of a flood control dam. Many of those dams are nearing the end of their useful life, just as the states are expected to experience more intense rain events. So are those dams safe? And what's the, how's that going to play out? Um, and should we maybe rethink uh, the way water is controlled and dammed in a, in a, in a world that was built in a world that was very predictable in terms of participation or precipitation. And now we have this very volatile world. So this, the health and status of dams and rethinking that, Martha. Yeah, I mean, the short answer would be no and yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, taking a look at, at dams as well as, as other infrastructure in the cities and how our cities are built, are they, are they able to sustain um, these high intensity precipitation events? You know, if, if, if it's going to fail for current climate events, it's absolutely going to fail for future climate events. I mean, we can only expect it to get wetter, more extreme precipitation events. And so certainly our, our planning efforts, if they're not incorporating these climate projections, if you're not planning for the climate of 2040 or 2060, then things there's going to be failure. There's going to be impacts uh, in a very extreme way, perhaps. So um, I, I've worked on a few projects, uh, not dams specifically, but I've worked with uh, cities in across uh, four states in the Midwest on how best to incorporate climate change uh, into the planning efforts and, and learned a lot about that and, and developed a tool um, in a participatory way with these mm -hmm. cities to make something that is useful to them and that they will take to their city council or to the, their mayor or the, this information kind of distilling these climate projects in a way that they can put it into actual planning efforts. Not something that as climatologists we think is important, but something that from the planning perspective that, that is useful and usable. So okay. absolutely, it's critically important. Greg, can I add to that? Um, sure. Because I think one thing I really, um, I think is important for folks to know about engineering and infrastructure is this concept of de the death of stationarity. It's a principle for engineering based on the idea that, you know, you design an infrastructure intervention for a specific kind of extreme event. And that the idea that that no longer holds in the era of climate change is really, really questioning how we do infrastructure design. And, and I really wanna underscore those little events being really crucial for everyday people to pay attention to. And we do that on ICChange.org, where we ask people to actually document persistent puddles, even if it's just a clogged storm catch basin or a broken pipe, because those are often indicators of lows that are gonna be consistent problems over time. Those end up being the places that flood first and worst during major events. And even in listening to some of the interviews coming out of the Michigan Dam failure, listening to folks talk about that, they're like, yeah, we knew this was the third major dam that broke. <laughs> you know, this, For many people in some of these places, they were not surprised by this catastrophic failure of our infrastructure. And it is overdue. It is, I think, what is it? Um, seven out of 10 is gonna, uh, dams are gonna be not, are, are, are gonna be getting a failing grade. Um, we need to be investing in infrastructure, but we need to be investing in, in infrastructure with climate change in mind. Um, and that's not happening at a federal level. That is, that is one thing that we can do different. Ed Kearns, when you hear uh, people, someone say, taking photos of, of little puddles, as a data scientist, do you, did your mind say, that's not scientific? That's, that's just, yeah. How do you respond as, as a data scientist when you hear someone taking, taking pictures of puddles on their street? 
Now that that, that kind of crowdsourcing information can it can be extremely valuable. Um, people's cell phones have have changed the world in, in, in so many different ways, right? The iPhone and, and uh, Android devices are really adding a lot of information to to uh, that that we get to use. Um, you know, one of the things though, is bringing this data together in such a way that it can be um, leveraged effectively. So this is one of the things that the First Street Foundation found as we were uh, putting together our, our, our model was that the adaptation features, there was no one place you could go to and get all the adaptation features that were necessary across the country to understand. And so the Army Corps has a national levy database. We started there, uh, but that had like around 7,000 features, something like that. Uh, the First Street Foundation actually sent a team throughout the country to go around and collect this information on local dams and levees and pumps. And they've amassed a database of over 23,000 adaptation features across the country right now. And we know it's still not complete, right? And so we, we are still seeking engagement with local communities so we can gather more information about where those adaptation features are, how they work, and so that we can we can represent them correctly in the model, because uh, I absolutely agree. We, we need to be planning for climate change into the future. And, and in fact, you know, personal story going back in 2008 when I was a federal employee at that time and uh, working with the Corps of Engineers in Miami on a coastal restoration effort. And uh, the engineer was you know, a very good engineer. And I had my sea level data you know, showing sea level rise in the area. And he said, uh, you know, Ed, I, I believe you as an engineer, I, I believe in your data, but you know, my, my, my kernel at the district has told me that I'm not to consider sea level rise in the formulation of this project. And it, you know, it stunned me because as, as, a, as a scientist, uh, I guess I was young at the time, not young anymore, but as a scientist, you know, a young scientist was like, wow, but the, the data say this, but, but the, uh, the government's gonna do that, right? And it really intrigued me. And in fact, it motivated me. And that's why I joined NOAA soon thereafter at, at the old National Climatic Data Center to work on climate products and figuring out different ways that we can introduce them into government and into communities so that they can use them for, for planning purposes. And uh, um, yeah, and, and you know, over the last 15 years with the federal government, you know, seeing lots of great data products being produced and being made in an open, transparent way so they could be picked up and used. It's, it's easier said than done uh, to actually use a lot of these complex products, as we talked about uh, earlier, uh, whether it's a climate model or an observation, you have to understand these things pretty well in order to use them. And I think as a community, it's going to take a community to bring these data sets together and these models together in the right way to actually inform decision making uh, so that we can have the kind of impacts and be prepared for the climate change that we know is coming. We're going to go to our lightning round for Martha Shelsky, Ed Kearns, and Julia Kamari Drapkin. Uh, beginning with Julia, uh, what's the first thing that comes to mind, unfiltered, uh, with reckless abandon, uh, when I mention current U.S. Senator James Inhofe? Uh, snowball. Snowball. Yeah, he famously <laughs> took a snowball into the U.S. Senate chamber to say that global warming is not happening. Ed Kearns, what's the first thing that comes to mind? First word or phrase. We're going to keep this word or phrase. Uh, Ed Kearns, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear Florida Governor Rick DeSantis? Data. Data. <laughs> That the first thing that comes to mind for every question. <laughs> um, uh, Julia, uh, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear donut economics? Awesome. Everybody should eat them, the donuts, the donut economics. Uh, it. Check it out. Ed, Ed Kearns, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear climate gentrification? Oh, uh, I guess blue lining. Uh, <laughs> Martha Shelsky, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear That's funny, not funny. <laughs> when you uh, Martha Shelsky, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the term flyover country? Teachable moment. Mm, good one. <laughs> yeah, not coastal snobs. Okay. Um, the uh, also for Martha, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear algal blooms in lakes? Green. I'm so <laughs> that's not a great answer. That's the first thing that came to mind. The color. Yeah. The water color. looks like yeah, it looks like jello on ICT and we see the photos. It's like that is an aside. In, in 2011, uh, James Inhofe jumped into Nebraska's Grand Lake and became very ill. He told the Tulsa newspaper that one of his granddaughters wouldn't swim in the green stuff on the surface of the lake. And Inhofe suggested that the headline of the story should be the environment strikes back. 
Um, these are true or false, uh, beginning with Julia, true or false. If you came into money, you would seriously consider buying a home right now in a high risk flood zone in your hometown on the Gulf Coast. <laughs> That's not fair. You know, <laughs> um, I would invest a lot of money in a high risk flood zone in a Gulf Coast town to have a conversation about how to adapt. So that's not true or false. That's just true. Yeah. Right, right. okay. That's how I would do it. Um, Ed Kern's true <laughs> or false. You would buy a home on the coast in your hometown of Miami. False. Uh, true or false. Martha Shulsky, the national climate conversation about flooding appropriately focuses mostly on the three coasts. False. <laughs> <laughs> uh, true or false, Ed Kern's climate models are flawed. No, true. Uh, <laughs> true or false for Ed, significant parts of Miami will be abandoned due to rising seas. I think that's uh, un un uncertain, I would say at this point. And I would Maybe. say back, back to the previous one, I would say that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Imperfect, perhaps better. Uh, <laughs> Julia Kamari Drapkin, true or false, the insurance industry will see rising profits from flooding and other extreme weather events driven by climate change. True. Uh, Martha Shelsky, true or false, the Army Corps of Engineers tries to compel water in certain directions, but ultimately water decides its own path. Oof. A little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, humans and nature, humans That's trying to no, shape no, nature. No, 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 um, uh, last one, yeah, it's, it's a lot to compress into these true or false. That's the that's the fun of it. Uh, last one for Julia Kamari Drapkin. Uh, this is not true or false, but what grade would you give public radio as a former public radio broadcaster yourself? <laughs> what grade would you give public radio for covering slow moving stories such as rising waters? Ooh, B plus. Okay. But better than others. Um, ah. And again, we're, I would, I'd say that I've never seen so much innovation in public media in terms of how we're, we, the, the royal public media, is responding to this crisis in terms of Zooms and Slack channels and more dialogue driven programs, which allow for nuance. So B, plus, but on its way to getting even better. Um, and I will say before I, I get the chance to leave the mic, uh, we IC Change is doing a flood, um, stormwater and um, flooding investigation in Miami. We're doing a very, we're partnered with the city of Miami. So stay tuned on some of those questions on climate gentrification and flooding. And the city of Miami has incredibly passionate cities and I have a lot of faith in, in, their, in them. Okay. And on Miami, uh, you know, uh, Ed, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers recently, just in June of 2020, uh, unveiled the plan to protect Miami-Dade County from hurricane storm surges over the next 50 years with floodgates across rivers, mile-long flood wall on its upscale waterfront, cost nearly $5 billion. I know this is a bit at the edge of, of your modeling, but where is all the money going to come from? And what, what are we looking at in terms of the, the price tag to protect American property from the, the floods that we know are coming? Yeah, well, you know, where the money will come from is, you know, from, of course, from our taxes. But um, these are going to be some really important uh, you know, decisions for communities to make with the federal government. And I think, uh, as you said, the, uh, what the what the core calls the Back Bay Project, uh, they've put that out. I think it's still open for comment. Uh, it may have closed for comment, but the process is very important here, right? So that the the federal government, in this case, is is, is putting a solution on the table, plan on the table, and asking for comment. And as Julia was saying, there's a lot of wonderful people in Miami, a lot of a lot of great water engineers, and a lot of civil servants that care very deeply about this, and they've gotten lots of great feedback going into the into the core process. So it's going to take some number of years to go through this, but uh, it is the community's decision about how the how the uh, city is going to be protected. The technology is there, uh, but these investment decisions are going to have to be a community effort. Yeah. And so I would just urge everybody in, in Miami, especially to participate in that process. Don't wait for this uh, this project to happen. You be part of the project, step into it and, and engage with that with with your federal government. Yeah. But the reality is we're not going to be able to, you know, I think in, in, embedded in that is, uh, you know, expecting money from Uncle Sam, which is often the case. Um, but we're just not going to be able to afford to uh, protect and defend 
every piece of property from either coastal, you know, ocean sea level rise or from, uh, from, from flooding rivers. So, you know, how are we going to decide um, managed retreat implicitly means that some people are not going to be protected. People are going to have to be bought out, move. Julia, you know, you, you are perhaps talking to people who are moving now, the human nation and, and other places. Mm -hmm. you know, th there's a story there. Is it truly to say how that's going to play out? Well, I think that managed retreat, which is, is very challenging. It's, and, and a lot of folks are assuming that these conversations are data-driven. I think it goes back to what we were been talking about earlier. If you march into my community and show me a map where everything is red in 2050 or 2070, that is a paralyzing experience. That does not actually generate the kinds of impacts that you would like to see, which is community members having conversations about what to do. It, it, it actually is a conversation ender. So when you ha create space for, for, for residents to really have conversations about what they've been seeing over time and how it is impacting them and what they want to do about it, that's when you can get into, okay, does it make sense for us to figure out a way for us to, to move? Nobody has figured that out. We are being asked to do that kind of work in terms of um, having community members use IC Change to, to, to have those very complicated and nuanced dialogues. But it is, there's no singular recipe for success on it so much as it is a community dialogue and decision. It will happen naturally over time as people face persistent risk and choose to leave a place. And it, there needs to be policies in place. There needs to be planning in place for who, who, which communities are going to grow adjacent to those communities that are retreating. There's going to be really interesting questions and conversations about how to undevelop the coast. And there will be um, innovations and, and opportunities therein. And one other thing about with regards to how we adapt and who's going to pay for it. I'd like, so there's a moment to, to remember and consider that in the early days of creating the in, infrastructure in the United States, it wasn't called infrastructure. It was called public works. Mm -hmm. It was considered a community act to channel fresh water from the mountains and bring it down to Colorado towns. It was considered a community act to create the earth and levees alongside the Mississippi River. So I think there is going to be a revisioning of what that means. But yes, we will be making decisions about where we live and that will be changing. Martha Scholsky, speaking of uh, community conversations, are the oil and gas industry part of the conversations you have um, in, in Nebraska? Um, not so much uh, in terms of conversations that I have. Um, we do engage some with, uh, with public power districts and uh, there is kind of a move toward uh, renewables uh, uh, in the state. So Nebraska has, has public power uh, districts. And, and so there, there is a move in that direction. There's, um, uh, but yes, I, so those are kind of my experiences there. What, what do we know, um, you know, uh, Ed, about, you know, what banks and lenders are doing? You, you mentioned blue lining earlier. That's the idea that, that I think that, that uh, you know, banks won't lend to an area because there's, there's water risk. I'd like to hear, you know, um, if this is starting to show up in, in business practices, either for lending, property prices, is this risk being factored into the market? Well, it's certainly being discussed now. And that, that was, you know, that, the the real purpose of the of the first street uh, floodfactor.com tool is to start this national uh, conversation and uh and for banks and, and mortgage holders to realize what level of risk they have today and how that how that risk in their portfolio is changing so i, I think w within the markets right now this is an active area of, of discussion um and, and people are just waking up to the reality since we can quantify that risk now and the quanti you know quantify the the, the, the potential losses on properties over long periods of time and, and such. These market forces are going to take a while to, you know, turn through the system. But, um, you know, it, I think it's really important that, that communities have access to the same information that, that big banks or big mortgage, low, uh, big uh, mortgage companies have too. So that everyone has the same information. Everybody's working off, off that same sheet uh, with that same understanding, because that's the way that as a community, we will drive towards the answers. And I read that your tool is going to be linked to Realtor.com so that people, I don't know if it's future, you know, you know, Zillow, Trulia, those sorts of things. So people are kind of looking around at property. There might be some sort of visual, hey, this is in a flood zone, you know, think about flood risk. 
Yeah, uh, you know, there's kind of data integrations. And, and so, you know, Realtor.com has, has announced that they're, they're working on that. And we're very excited about that because those kinds of data integrations are uh, really how people consume this information. Uh, you know, uh, if you're already aware of the problem, you may go to a portal like floodfactor.com to look it up or go to see your FEMA flood map from, from the government website uh, or look up your local floodplain uh, manager's number and, and understand. Uh, but for, for most people, who, if they're not aware of the information yet, if they're not aware of their risk, they're going to consume that information in some kind of you know more transparent way. Uh, they're going to pick it up on the go, just like we do. You know, I like to use uh, weather data as an example. Uh, very few of us go to the you know to weather dot uh, weather dot gov to go get our, our our forecast from NOAA. Majority of people uh, gather that information through data integrations, through uh, other apps, through their local TV station, maybe even on the edge of the browser. If someone's watching this online right now, maybe there's a little weather icon that shows what what the weather is outside right now or what it's going to be tomorrow that's how people consume information most readily so yes we're, we're at first we're very excited about these kinds of uh, data integrations because that information become, can be become um, uh, you know uh, in front of people's eyes uh, more quickly and they become aware of the situation uh, of what their flood risk is today much more easily Julie Kamari Drapkin, what do you see as the, the cutting edge, the kind of the interesting piece of what banks and, and insurance companies are, are doing in terms of markets, you know, market signals that the people, because uh, those have been really suppressed so far. Um, where do you see the, the leading edge in terms of what the financial markets are recognizing regarding flood risk? I think it's a, it's, it's a complicated question. Um, I think that it gets a little dangerous when we're using a singular data source to make those decisions. Um, the insurance companies themselves have their, the, some of the most sophisticated models and they're not sharing. And that is <laughs> that of itself. So if you have access to one of those models, then you have a one up on a lot of other folks, including like understanding the granularity of the model. So again, we're trying to democratize, we're trying to democratize granularity because um, it just because a model or FEMA says it floods here, and then you look at the actual event and it doesn't. If you know that that property is less risky, then you would have a greater advantage. I am, I am happy that there is a consideration in lending with regards to flood risk. But I actually think I was, you know, I think there's a moment to educate, per, you know, in the moment of buying a home about flood risk. We, we are required to have flood risk in certain areas, but not all. And there is that education moment on behalf of the purchaser as well as the lender and then the derivative products therein. If we choose to engage in those moments about what it takes to protect properties and to stay, um, to mitigate risk, then that actually is, I think, the greatest opportunity, including incentivizing uh, adaptation efforts, incentivizing green infrastructure, incentivizing flood mitigation in a way to lower your insurance rate, to lower a mortgage rate. Um, so I'd love to see that kind of that kind of incentive structure built into the system. Martha Shelsky, for people um, who uh, think about like it, like the farmer we we heard from earlier, um, Jack Milliken, you know, who says, "Oh, it's really hot or it's really dry." Help us understand, you know, the from a climate scientist perspective, how it can be both. We're seeing we're seeing warmer and drier and wetter together. That's a very confusing for people. Um, it is, yeah. I, I think they're, you know, the climate system is really complex and, and it's tough to for the average person to understand all the nuances of climate change. And there are regional aspects to climate change. There are temporal aspects to climate change. I, you know, the, uh, it was just brought up uh, Senator Inhofe and the snowball. Yes, you can have a cold winter. We had, a, we had the, the seventh coldest February in Nebraska and, and yet we can still have climate change. Um, so, um, uh, so I, I think that's that's important to try and educate people about weather, the scale of weather versus the scale of climate, and that things change at different rates. There are parts of the world that that are not warming nearly as much as as others, you know, isolated parts. And whenever I communicate about the topic of climate change, I always begin with this regional variability, uh, with temporal variability, and what's the difference between weather and climate? Because people often confuse those terms and think, 
how can we have, how can it be cold today when there's supposed to be global warming? And it's, you know, um, that I ate, I, I had lunch today, so there's no world hunger. I, it's, you know, there's some examples that you can use uh, to that, but I, I always show a global map of the, of the previous month or season and, and put Nebraska in the context of the global um, temperatures. And, and so I think that's a really important message. And, and you can use recent examples um, to help illustrate that concept to people. But it's a difficult one to understand. And Kearns, even some highly educated, sophisticated people can have trouble with this. You had a call from a floodplain manager in Nebraska asking him to remove his town from the flood zone. How did that go down? Explain, tell us that yeah. story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right, right after uh, we launched, we, we had a call from uh, from somebody from North Platte uh, that was concerned because they had just uh, negotiated with FEMA over the last four years to have the majority of the town of North Platte removed from the FEMA you know, one in 100 floodplain. Um, and uh, when they looked at the uh, first street numbers, when we, when we published those, they saw a flood risk in the middle of their city and they were somewhat aghast at oh, how, how can this be? And we've just worked so hard to get to this point. And now you're saying we have flood risk. So in talking to the fellow through on the phone, you know, uh, uh, you know very, very nice fellow really understood uh, the, the situation well. And as I explained to him, well, you know, first street method is different and we're, we're accounting for this heavy rainfall that's not being accounted for in the FEMA model. And uh, this fellow is also a historian. Uh, and he's like, oh, hold on a second. You know, let me go back to the 1942 newspaper events because we had this major rainfall event in 1942. And on the phone, he's asking me to take a look at, you know, this intersection here, that intersection there where this property is and to tell me what the, the hazard layers that we have, what we're seeing. And I was showing flooding in exactly those areas. He goes, yeah, all right, you got it. It's exactly where uh, the newspaper accounts in 1942 after this heavy rainfall. This is exactly where we saw flooding. So it wasn't a river an event. It wasn't the snow melt coming out of the out of the mountains. It was a heavy rainfall local event, mm -hmm. and it matched uh, our, our estimates matched the historical event in 1942. And the light bulb went on for for uh, for this man, right? Because like, oh, okay, I get it. Methodology is different. This is a different kind of flood risk that's not being taken into account. Matt, all right, now I got it. Now I can use this information. So that was uh, that was a wonderful experience. Rare example of someone changing someone's mind in a pretty short period of time. That doesn't happen. Um, very often. Also, Ed Kearns, you know, I looked at your, um, I looked up the National Mall, uh, you know, because there's some suggestion that the Potomac River is, you know, encroaching on the, this iconic uh, place in our country's uh, history, our na national capital. What are some of the places that are really iconic in the American mind, like the National Mall, that are, are at risk? Because, um, you know, it's, it's happening there at, right at the mall. Yeah, well, I, I haven't gone through and looked at all the different places, but you know, a lot of that area, of course, was a wetland when it was uh, when it was created way back when. Uh, but, you know, yeah. but yeah, so these, you know, and as Julie mentioned before, you know, the main thing to get across is that, you know, this uh, this idea of stationarity is is dead, uh, that, you know, uh, 10 years from now is not going to look like today. And it's certainly not going to look like it was 10 years ago. And and this goes for all these things that, you know, uh, uh, for national monuments and these kinds of, uh, you know, parks, uh, uh, you know, landmarks that we've all taken for granted. Um, you know, these, these things with, with rising tides, uh, with increased rainfalls, heavier rainfalls, these are things that the change is coming and, uh, and it kind of shocks us all, right? Cause it's, it's climate change is not intuitive back to like Martha's, uh, you know, points it, it's, you have to kind of explain it in a different way. Even for a, a scientist, we're still human. It's still not intuitive to us either. That's why we lean on the science and we lean on the probabilities. We lean on the numbers because th this is telling, this is telling the story that as humans, we have a hard time grasping because in our lifetimes, we're used to seeing change with our eyes at a certain rate and at a certain scale. And climate change is just different. It's at scales of time and space that is hard for any one individual to understand. And so as a scientist, yeah, I, 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 lean, I lean on on those projections. I lean on the data. It's natural for me. It's not necessarily natural for everybody else. But like you said, with the with, with national landmarks, or whatever it might be, people become surprised when they see uh, you know, these, these kinds of, uh, like in the, in the Florida Everglades, right, where you can see, I mentioned as we started this program, you can see the climate change coming, you can see the sea level uh, is much higher than it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, if you know where to look. Um, to, to me, as, you know, as, as a fisherman and stuff, uh, it, it's shocking, like, oh, wow, I can really see that now. I, I can see with my own eyes how much that sea level has changed. Uh, we're all going to have those, those kind of personal experiences. And I think as communicators, I think leveraging that personal connection to these things is very important to get the point across. 
And also remembering it because you, the human brain is really binary in the sense that you can't remember, you can remember last year's weather, but you can't, and you can remember this year's weather, but five years ago, can you tell me what the winter was doing? And so we actually have created that process that you described with the man with the newspaper at, at scale on IC change for people to be able to track these events and the micro details in their own personal lives over time so they can actually see it. Because the, the mechanisms we have for telling stories, and you asked me about public media and grading it in terms of its ability to cover this, we're actually up against our own brains a little bit in terms of how we understand change over time. The social science suggests that we we adapt, and we've been working with social scientists to, to kind of analyze some of our data on IC change about how people describe these events over time, and it's actually its own quantitative data. But the human brain uh, adapts within a window of two to eight years, right? We Suddenly, there were people in Ocean City, New Jersey, who've been flooding since the 90s, who stopped considering that a special thing, and they stopped posting about it on social media. But on IC change, we prompt them, hey, we heard about flooding, there's a tidal event, there's a rain event check your rain gauge, show us which intersection. And over time, we have that accumulated data for people to see the extent changing, the subtle changes over time. Because two to eight years, when we have 10 years to actually do something about this problem, isn't going to fly. Our greatest asset to adapt is also our greatest vulnerability. That's where it gets really dark. And people say that, well, humans will just accept a world without glaciers. They'll just, we'll just kind of shrug and say, oh, we'll just, you know, accept this world and we'll adapt and 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 people will, will be born and and never know that there you know there was some of the, the things that we've lost uh glaciers biodiversity tropical rainforests. Mm -hmm. they'll they'll be sort of like buffalo roaming the american plains mm -hmm. something that none of us ever really experienced we hear about as history in the past and we accept it as the way it is that's where it can you can get pretty um yeah fatalistic about this i want to ask martha about you know uh is your state doesn't have a state climate action plan yet, given all that we're talking about, the overwhelming data. Uh, tell us about, you know, the prospect for a state climate action plan um, in Nebraska. Yeah, well, they've tried for several years. Um, so I've provided testimony for that. And um, it's actually, I use that as a teaching tool in my class. So I teach a 100 level introduction to climate change. And we talk about the science, the symptoms and the solutions and talk a lot about human behavior and how to reach people. And so I use that in my class of uh, last year. Um, there was a bill going through and I testified and, and we talked about how do you develop a testimony? And one of my students showed up, he was a freshman first generation college students from Chicago and came up there without a script and spoke. And so, um, so it's a, a neat story of, uh, out of that uh, semester of teaching, but um, yeah, so it, it's, it's tried and failed. Um, it just tried with this, within this past week, the legislature uh, came back um, after the COVID break and, and uh, it failed miserably, unfortunately. Um, but so then I, I think you have to get to it with another angle. Um, what Nebraska did pass was a soil health task force. Um, healthy soils can go a long way toward climate change mitigation in an agricultural place like Nebraska. It won't get you everywhere you need to go, but at least it's a start. And um, we, I've had a lot of conversations with uh, ne Nebraska lawmakers at the state and federal level with regard to the flood and impacts to that. And we're getting wetter and what's going on with that and uh, tackling it from the weather angle. And maybe you don't call it a climate action plan. Does it, mm -hmm. you know, titles can be everything. And if you're going to turn people off from the beginning, then don't even use it. And that's, I understand people feel differently about that, but when you're trying to move the needle forward and, um, there, there are key words that people can't get past, come around it from another angle. And I, you know, in talking to uh, a range of, of people around Nebraska, I, I think um, a lot of folks in the agricultural community feel blame for, you know, mm. you're the reason for this problem is, you know, people are pointing the finger at them. And mm. that's, that's not really not a way to get people yeah. to change their behavior if they're being blamed for it. So, you know, bring them to the to the table. They, they don't want to be on the menu. They want to be at the table and part of the solution. And that's when I start to see change in people's mindset and change in the way people think about it is that let's look for innovative solutions that will benefit everybody um, at my profitability, my uh, conservation practices and keeping the land for generations to come and, and keeping it viable. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
So that was kind of a long-winded answer, but I, I think I think getting around that those words that are problematic for some people. Yeah. As we wrap up, I want to ask you about sort of a water risk that you face in your own life and and how your um, how you are managing it. I'm putting in a, a gray water system and a cistern, which is kind of like folks what my grandparents had uh, in upstate New York. Uh, Ed Kearns, what what is you know what's some of the water risk that you have in your life and and how are you managing it? Well, I think I removed most of the water risk 12 years ago when I moved from Miami, Florida to Asheville, North Carolina. So I went from about four feet sea level uh, above sea level to 2,500 feet above sea level on the side of a mountain. Uh, so um, in, in, in Asheville, you know, this, not that we don't have flooding here. We do have flooding in the river valleys. I just, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, literally up on the, on the hill above that. So, uh, yeah, so in my case, I've, uh, I've mitigated that, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the risk from storm surge in particular. By, by moving inland quite a bit. <laughs> a lot of people look at flood risk and if they think they live at elevation, they're insulated from that risk. And then until someone tells them, well, when they flush their toilet, it goes down to sea level, uh, a, a water treatment plant or their, their food comes from some, some risk area. So yeah, so there are risks even if you associate uh, live on a hills. Julia Kamari Dropkin, what, how are your water risk? And you've told us a little bit about how you're living Hi. living on the edge in New Orleans. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't say living on the edge. I think I'm informed and I'm working with my neighbors to be informed. One of our most successful flooding pilots is two neighborhoods over in, in the kind of a wider neighborhood called the Gentilly Resilience District, where the city is experimenting with green infrastructure at scale in a neighborhood to store stormwater. And we've been, we mobilize residents to take pictures of flooding and also to track each storm with a rain gauge. And actually everyone is starting to understand what kinds of rain rates create dangerous conditions. These stormwater projects, one of them is a 10 year, gonna manage a 10 year flood and the other one's gonna manage a five year flood. And thanks to these residents on IC Change, we've increased the storage capacity of some of those infrastructure projects uh, in design. They've changed the design of multi-million dollar HUD funded infrastructure projects using their data. And that is going to have a direct benefit. Is it gonna eliminate the risk? No, in a city like New Orleans, we will, flood and we are learning to live with that water. That means that on certain days when I hear a rain rate or I look at a rain rate or I understand the conditions, I know not to drive my car. Um, I am lucky in the city in terms of being at zero. Uh, we This house only took water during Katrina, which was not a natural disaster. It was a man-made disaster. Um, but I feel that the more we understand how our particular neighborhood block by block is experiencing a rain event, we will understand what it can and cannot do. I will understand what my rain garden can handle. I will understand when the punks are overwhelmed and they will be, even if they're functioning 100%, all of our catch basins and storm drains are clean. And so I can manage risk that way. And then there's other things that we do. Um, you know, we, uh, we have rain barrels. We, that's more for drought, frankly, but it's still a help. We're energy efficient which is one of the greatest ways you can combat uh, climate change cheaply and efficiently and effectively. Um, and there's so many ways that you as an individual can act. There's so many ways that you in your neighborhood you can act. And there's so many ways you can do it at a citywide level. We have a, a citywide rain gauge program. We have a citywide heat sensing program. Uh, and then now Miami, we're working in Miami, we're working in Boston, we're working across the country. So every community has a different way of learning lessons on how to adapt. And we should share them because not every solution works for my community as it works for yours. But if we're learning together, we're figuring it out. We have about a minute left. Martha Shulsky, how are you <laughs> uh, managing your risky relationship with water? Yeah, I guess I'll put a personal spin on it. And uh, as a mother, I, you know, I find that one of the most important things that we can do is teach our children how to best manage their resources and conserve their resources and have an appreciation for the natural world around them and, and, and develop and foster their curiosity. And so we do lots of nature exploring and boot adventuring and, and trying to understand the world around us. If you're just joining us, we're talking about flooding in America's heartland. I'm Greg Dalton. My guests are Julia Kamari Drapkin, CEO and founder of IC Change, a social impact company lifting up stories about climate 
change, Ed Kern's chief data officer at First Street Foundation, which makes flood risk information available to the public, and Martha Shulsky, director of the Nebraska State Climate Office. I'd like to give a shout out to the Climate One team making this happen from their homes using new tools. Uh, and on Climate One today, we've been talking about flooding in America's heartland and beyond. I'd like to thank you for your insights, This uh, to all three of you for your sharing your stories with water, new relationship with water. This program is generally seen underwritten by the Water Foundation. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Please help us get more people talking about climate by telling a friend, sharing your story, and talking about our podcast. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. the evening news anchor for ABC 7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 100 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, and many, many more. Every program includes a live chat. So you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50 percent. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329 4231. That is, donate to 329 4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website, commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe.